morning, everyone. For those that don't know me, I'm Sharon. I'm one of the first year registrars. Um, so I'll be talking about cerebral oximetry and its applications in anaesthetics and critical care. And what, what prompted me to talk about this topic was the recent media attention on this gentleman who was a New Zealand footballer who went in for elective surgery at St Vincent's private hospital in 2011 and, and never came out of surgery, oh, never woke up from surgery. Um, so this man, he's a 50 year old gentleman who went in for elective rotator cuff surgery. As far as we know, his only past medical history was hypertension, for which he was on an ACE inhibitor. Um, otherwise, he was a very fit man, went to the gym every day, and was an ex-football player. So preoperatively, he had his ACE inhibitor the morning of the surgery, and he also went to the gym the morning of, of his operation. Um, he was put into the beach chair position for his surgery, so that's um, the head very steep, sort of 40 to 70 degrees position. Uh, we know that the anaesthetist stepped out for a minute or two soon after induction, um, just to check on a previous patient. During that time I'm not, I'm not sure what happened, but post-operatively the patient did not wake up uh, from surgery and he died three days later from a massive um, cerebral stroke. So the inquest into his death continues and it's led to um, changes in the guidelines for beach chair surgery at the two St Vincent's hospitals. Um, I tried calling the anaesthetic department of St Vincent's a number of times but they, they're not going to reveal what their changes are and they're still in the process of making those changes but the NUM did tell me that there have been some sort of implementation of a cerebral perfusion monitor as a routine for all their um, beach chair surgeries. So I guess the question raised um, from this case is should we be monitoring cerebral perfusion in um, beach chair position surgeries and other surgeries where brain hypoxia can occur frequently? And if so, how? What's the best method of, of, of doing it? So there's a range of cerebral perfusion monitors that exist. Um, we use the EEG to measure neuronal activity. Um, it does require a degree of technical skill to interpret. Um, transcranial Dopplers, which also needs some technical skill, and it can't be achieved in all patients because you need that, that temporal window. Um, there's somatosensory evoked potentials, which can measure the brain's response to a peripheral nerve stimulus. And again, that requires some, some skill in interpreting the result. There's jugular bulb oximetry, which provides a good global measurement of, of saturation in the brain, um, but it is invasive. And there's carotid stump pressures that are used for carotid endarterectomy surgery to decide on when to um, insert a shunt. And then we have NERS or near infrared spectroscopy or cerebral oximetry. And the main advantage of this technology is that it's non-invasive. Um, it gives you a continuous real-time reading of the brain saturation levels and it requires minimal skill to interpret. So for the rest of the talk um, I'll be going through the principles of NERS. Um, some of the limitations inherent in its technology and the clinical applications in, in various surgeries and also a little bit in critical care. So, near-infrared spectroscopy um, is based on the transmission and absorption of near-infrared light as it passes through tissue. We know that body tissue is relatively transparent to light in the near-infrared spectrum, um, even bone. And certain molecules, molecules of interest like haemoglobin and oxygenated haemoglobin um, have distinct absorption spectra in the near-infrared range. Um, now the technology is similar um, to pulse oximetry um, in that it uses differences in light absorption between your haemoglobin and your oxygenated haemoglobin um, to measure regional saturation. In pulse oximetry, you've got light at these troughs um, light absorption at these troughs are subtracted from light absorption at these peaks um, to give you an absorption characteristic of pulsatile or arterial blood. And all these other, this DC component or this so-called perfusion index component is information that's thrown away from the pulse oximeter. But that's exactly the information that the cerebral oximeter uses um, into looking into the entire non-pulsatile field to derive um, tissue oxygen saturations. Now the, the end number for the cerebral oximeter is more venous weighted 
um, than arterial because it collects that entire return signal rather than focusing just on the pulsatile element. Um, I thought I'd go into a little bit of light physics to do with light absorption and scattering. Um, so in an ideal situation in figure A, the only cause of light attenuation between the light source and, and the detector is absorption by molecules that we call chromophores. Um, this is essentially B. Lambert's law, um, which, which states that light attenuation is directly proportional to three variables. So the distance that the light travels between the light source and the detector, the concentration of your chromophore and the absorption coefficient of the chromophore. And from that, in this hypothetical situation, you should be able to determine the haemoglobin concentration. Now, in figure B, which is biological material, it's a bit more complicated. And you, you get a lot of losses of, of your photons due to scattering. And that's a major contributor to attenuation of light. So in the adult head, scattering attenuates near infrared light to such an extent that it cannot pass across the whole head. And this diagram is my attempt at showing um, near infrared light being emitted at one end and then being lost due to scattering and never actually reaching the photo detector at the other end. So most um, commercial devices use a modified application of B. Lambert's law um, to take into account scattering. And they use a thing called spatially resolved spectroscopy or um, multi-distance spectroscopy, which is a bit beyond the scope of this talk and my brain. Um, so the typical cerebral oximeter, um, you have your light source. So you have your laser light source, and it usually has two um, photo detectors. One that's placed about one to two centimeters away from the light source, and that primarily detects, um, um, it collects information from the extra cere cerebral tissue, so bone and scalp. And you have another electrode, um, photo detector, sorry, that's placed about five centimeters away, and that detects, um, that picks up light, both from extracerebral tissue as well as deeper brain tissue. And then a subtraction algorithm is used to try and find the saturation of just the, just the brain tissue of interest. So there's a variety of monitors that exist on the market, and they're all very rapidly evolving. Um, they started off as ipsilateral monitors, now there's bilateral monitors. Um, I believe Semantics is the most common um, brand that's used in Australia, and it's the most common one that's used in research. Um, and in Australia, cardiac surgery is where these devices have had the highest um, degree of uptake. And they're about, I've been told they're about $150 um, each and um, disposable use, of course. <laughs> Um, so some of the limitations of NERS is the lack of standardization between the different commercial devices. Um, one of the problems with having so many different manufacturers is that algorithms vary um, between systems and some manufacturers don't actually publish their algorithms, uh, making it hard to validate data and also to compare data between, between devices. Um, other limitations include other molecules that, that, that travel in the path of the light that contribute to the nerves reading. So things like skin pigmentation um, can alter absorption, the presence of bilirubin. Um, when nerves is used for peripheral tissue, because it can be used for peripheral muscle, um, the presence of myoglobin um, can confound the absorption readings. And, uh, and it does only measure the frontal lobe, so you can argue that it's not, it's not a true global assessment of cerebral perfusion. Um, also pathologies such as subdural hematomas, extradural hematomas and edema can also confound um, the measurements. Now there's a very, very wide um, variation in what's considered normal. Um, cerebral saturations and it's estimated to be anywhere between sort of 65 to 75 percent. Um, so it's been suggested that the cerebral oximeter is best used as a trend monitor um, rather than using absolute thresholds to detect cerebral ischemia. Um, there's no gold standard to validate this technology um, and one of the other limitations is 
or w what is the correct intervention that should be taken if your cerebral sats do drop. Um, so there's, a, there's this absence of a defined protocol to treat a drop in sats. This is an example of an, of an algorithm used if you do get a drop in your cerebral saturations. So you do things like um, check the map if the patient's hypotensive, you treat and find the etiology. If that's normal, then you move on to systemic saturations. Um, if that's abnormal, you treat it and find the etiology, et cetera. You know, and if, if you're hyperventilating the patient and causing vasoconstriction, then you should correct the hyperventilation and normalize their, their CO2 levels, et cetera, et cetera. And I guess you could argue that, well, these things should be in place anyway, and you shouldn't have to have a cerebral monitor to say, oh, check these things, you know, check the hemoglobin, check this, check that. So the cerebral oximeter has been used a lot in research, both on animals and humans, but it hasn't really been matched um, by clinical applications. So in carotid endarterectomy surgery, there's a five, um, approximately three to five percent risk of stroke, either from a thromboembolic event or from um, cross clamp related ischemia. Um, so strategy to, pre to prevent cerebral ischemia include the, the placement of an intracarotid shunt. And there's lots of methods to assess this critical decision of whether or not to place this shunt. Um, under regional, the clinical neurological exam or assessing a patient's mental state is considered gold standard. Um, whereas under general anesthetic, there's multiple modalities that are used, um, including carotid stump pressures. So the role of NERS in carotid antarterectomy um, there's some consistent data that shows agreement between cerebral oximetry and other monitoring modalities. Um, there was a prospective study done in 2007 by Moritz of um, 48 patients. Um, and these 48 patients had their carotid endarterectomies done under regional. So they used um, the neurological exam as their gold standard. And neurological deterioration occurred in 12 uh, out of the 48 and all of them showed, um, sorry, all the, all the modalities, including transcranial Doppler, EEG, somatocentric evoked potentials, and stump pressures, had the ability to, dis to distinguish the ischemic from the non-ischemic patients, as well as cerebral oximetry. And it showed that the values um, from the cerebral oximeter correlated very well with all the other modalities. Um, and it had very similar sensitivity and specificities of about 83 and 86% when the SATs reduced 20% from the baseline. And there's been studies to show similar levels of agreement in GA cases as well. So although cerebral oximetry hasn't been proven to be superior to other monitoring modalities in carotid surgery, it's, it, there's some evidence to say that, that it is equivalent, plus it's got that advantage of being non-invasive and not requiring much technical mm. skill. Um, there is some uncertainty as to the exact threshold by which you decide that yes, this is critical ischemia and when to act. Um, and studies have reported anywhere from an 11% decrease from baseline to a 20% decrease in baseline saturations. Okay, cardiac surgery. Um, the incidence of stroke anywhere from one to 3%. Um, but this is, this is overshadowed by the, the rate of long-standing cognitive dysfunction, um, which is greater than 50%. Greater than um, there was a landmark study done in 2007 by Merkin and colleagues, where they randomized 200 patients undergoing cardiac <coughs> bypass to either <coughs> cerebral saturation monitoring <coughs> with an active intervention protocol and that protocol aimed to maintain the cerebral sats greater than 75% of the baseline, or they were randomly assigned to a control group um, where the screen was blinded to the anaesthetist and recorded in the background. So it, there, was, there was 100 patients in each group, so 100 patients being um, intervened and 100 patients just being recorded blindly. So these <coughs> were the types of interventions um, <coughs> that were undertaken to restore the <coughs> cerebral saturations back to near baseline. Out of the 100 patients, about half of them, so 56 of them needed some sort of intervention. 
um, to restore their saturations and the majority of those 56 needed three or more interventions to bring to bring their sats up with an overall success rate of 80 percent and this is um, just a table showing the outcomes of the patients in the control group that had no intervention versus the um, versus the intervention group and whilst there was no difference <coughs> Well, th there were more strokes in the control group than there were in the intervention group, but that wasn't um, a significant difference. There was significantly less major organ morbidity and mortality in patients who had their cerebral monitors, um, their SATs monitored and acted upon compared to the control group. Um, so the interventions undertaken to optimise cerebral perfusion may have a beneficial effect on perfusing other organ systems um, and improving clinical outcomes in that way. Yep, I just said that. Okay. And just out of interest, I've included this, um, this recent prospective observational study, um, which was done ov on over a thousand patients undergoing bypass surgery. And these patients just had their pre-operative cerebral SATs measured, um, so nothing intraoperatively. And it just found that those that had low pre-operative cerebral saturations correlated very strongly with them. Um, post-operative adverse events like um, renal failure, cardiac dysfunction and death within three days. And the authors from this study concluded that pre-operative satu um, cerebral saturations under 50% was an independent risk factor for 30-day and one-year mortality. So perhaps um, pre-operative cerebral saturation measurement may be a useful risk, risk stratification tool in patients un undergoing bypass. Coming back to our beach chair surgery, um, there was a recent observational study in 2010 of 124 patients who were undergoing shoulder surgery either in the beach chair or the lateral decubitus position. And cerebral saturations were greater than 20% drop from baseline occurred in 80% of patients in the beach chair position compared to zero of those lying in the, in the lateral position. So, and this occurred despite um, a protocol designed to maintain their heart rate and blood pressure. And there was no significant difference between heart rate and blood pressure between, between the two groups. Um, now, despite this massive difference in the cerebral desaturation episodes, um, there was no post-operative neurological abnormalities in either group. Um, the actual incidence of um, post-operative neurological damage in beach chest surgery has been estimated to be about three in a hundred thousand. So it's, it's not clear how the very high incidence of cerebral desaturation relates to the very low incidence of neurological damage and perhaps length of surgery um, may have an important role in this. Um, the, but both these surgeries, the beach chair and the lateral decubitus surgeries were approximately two hours in duration. Um, so the role of NERS in monitoring and preventing cerebral ischemia in this surgery is, is really unclear. There's not much evidence for it. Now, moving on to acute brain injury. The investigations are solely observational. Um, again, reasons being lack of a gold standard to, compa to compare NERS, NERS measurements to, as well as pathological factors that interfere um, and invalidate some of the assumptions based on the NERS-derived algorithms. Having said that, there's been recent interest in using NERS to detect um, cerebral vasospasm in the context of subarachnoid hemorrhage. So again, all observational studies, but this one done in 2007 had um, 32 patients who, um, who all had subarachnoid, varying grades of subarachnoid hemorrhage. And out of the 32 patients, 15 of them had angiographic evidence of vasospasm as they were coiling. And all of these were associated um, with a reduction in cerebral oximetry values. Um, even the ones that were only like 25%, like considered small vasospasm, had, um, had a associated drop in cerebral saturations. Um, with traumatic brain injury, I, I pulled out this study, but um, that was done in 2010, um, published in the Journal of Intensive Care Medicine. 
So it was an observational study of 22 patients with um, blunt traumatic brain injury, and none of them had any extradural or subdural hematomas. Um, and they used, they used um, an invasive brain tissue oxygen tension catheter as their gold standard. I've never seen this catheter used. I'm not sure if it's used in the ICU here, but that was their gold standard. And they found that if your cerebral sats dropped below 60%, um, that was moderately accurate for predicting severe hypoxia um, as measured by the invasive brain tissue oxygen tension catheter uh, with sensitivity specificity at around 73 and 83%. However, cerebral oximetry was, was really poor at detecting moderate, hy moderate um, cerebral hypoxia based on the invasive catheter. Um, so to summarize, um, cerebral oximetry monitors, they're still a maturing technology um, and they come with a lot, of, a lot of limitations. We know that they can detect clinically significant desaturation events, um, but there's, there's an overwhelming lack of data demonstrating um, improved um, clinical outcomes with its use. Any questions? There, there was there was a lot there were studies done in the 90s because this technology has been around for over 25 years and yeah. the, there were a lot of animal studies done in the 90s that compared jugular bulb oh, oximetry no. um, to that animals. That, now the technique in Europe, I see many articles in, we don't do in Australia in Europe. They directly measure the sa tissue saturation, okay. the tissue lactate in the brain substance of uh, by the injured patient. Doing their doing neurosurge cooperation, neurosurge and insert the microdialysis catheter into the brain substance. Okay. And they, they would not where they come from. Right. They would directly right. measure the saturation of the brain. So is, that brain similar, tissue. is that similar to that traumatic brain injury? Yeah, so, so it's the same because I've never seen those catheters. <laughs> just did a poor correlation. Yeah. Something that you say should be the gold standard. So mm. In the human study, yeah. I think mm. one of the problems with that technique is, is placement because I mean, <coughs> not only do you have difficulty placing these things, there's some, some mechanical problems with these uh, these devices and the um, um, catheters. 
and also where do you place it if it's in the wrong position if there's an area of ischemia if it's on the other side of the brain it's not going to be that's right it's, it's only one point yeah. that's right that's the whole thing isn't it about whether it's global ischemia yeah. or whether that it's is global mm -hmm. that's the problem because where you would brain injuries there's more there there were area that very badly damaged brain there's a gray area mm. it's a good mm. area so that is not a good uh, model to to learn the uh, monitor mm -hmm. because in mm -hmm. clinical anesthetic practice most of the time the brain is normal okay so we want to instrument the blood pressure the oxygen or the saturation or CO2 or the temperature to alter this CO saturation but in brain injury and they pick that one is high yeah, because yeah. It's, it's just a gray area there's many gray areas mm. of the brain so where you put the monitor you put in a normal brain area the gray area or the injured area, or the so area yeah. all together maybe you, you try to put the prop in the injured area that area was damaged mm. you don't you can't do anything you want to put in a gray area or a normal area to, to protect it from further damage mm. Mm. Can I ask you about the beach chair position? One of the reasons the neurosurgeon is uh, doing this procedure and the neurological procedures in the beach chair less often these days is because of the poor neurological outcomes. So, so how, how we, do we monitor these frequently the same patients who are, who are managed with their shoulders in the beach chair position? Do we use oximetry, do we use blood, you know, maps, do we use what do we use? Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I've heard of people putting in arterial lines and putting the transducer at the level of the circle of Willis. Um, but I mean, w with with the, the study that I read, it, like heart rate, blood pressure were the same. Were pretty much the same in in each group, the lateral group and the and and, and the beach chair group. And there was this significant, like eighty percent of the people in the beach chair had a drop in cerebral saturations, despite seemingly normal yeah, blood blood pressures. In, in, in the absence of several oximetry, we just need to be more aggressive and, and mm -hmm. aim for higher blood pressure. Should we aim? For, yeah. There's no doubt, these, I, I see a lot of these patients, there's no doubt that they drop their blood pressures frequently. And it's, it's quite common to be using vasopressin, particularly if they've had a block. If they haven't had a block, it's uh, less common to be mm -hmm. Well, I think the beach chair position with shoulder surgery should yeah. be like the sitting position with um, neurosurgery should be up long to the historical books and then you wouldn't have a problem. Mm. Yeah. Like, is it necessary? Because, I mean, there is an alternative option. Many of the big chair positions, shoulder are young people. I guess in a very few patients were all sick patients. I get when that you, you probably pay more attention to to simple saturation. But don't forget when the brain got ability to adapt. I think it the what the critical what the critical uh, option uh, blood flow is very low, up to five, ten folds. So the brain, right. even though you, it's ischemic, the brain will adapt, will attract more oxygen. Mm -hmm. So I guess that the monitor, if you ever come into more clinical practice, mm -hmm. will be in patient who is six and old. But when you on young patient, you waste your money and you lack faith. You you starting to work on the patient, also thing get the blood pressure up, get the oxygen up get this uh, hemoglobin up, you do a lot of things, mm. probably will call harms, because you know that by now and I know young patient, nothing happening. Yeah, nothing yeah. Happening. yeah. You said that it's good as a screening tool for patients that are at risk of cerebral perfusion. If you do have an early person with rotated cuff, you could use it as a evidence to argue that they can't be in beach chair, they need to be in left lateral because they have yeah. <laughs> a risk of mm. cerebral Yeah, that's perfusion, possible. You know what I mean? Except that study hasn't been done, so we can't be really arguing. You said it was as good as the entropy or bis monitor is for for carotid for, for carotid surgery. surgery. That wasn't any better. It wasn't any better. So they had they had very similar sensitivity specificities um, at picking up, like compared to the gold standard, which was assessing their mental state. Um, I, I think it was in, in the eighty percent eighty percentile. Yeah, so what you want to do is draw one of those. Rock, rock curves that choose for the receiver operating characteristic where you choose the yeah, that point and work out the relationship between sensitivity and specificity. There's not enough numbers for it. Yes, yeah. The impression um, the monitor is sensitive 
but not specific. So they give a lot of false alarm, and you start to work yes. on the patient, and then when you work too much on it, you go ham, blood even, all something. Unnecessary it, transfusions. Then you go ham. So yeah. how do we pick patients? I've got a feeling that maybe on a sick old patient, that probably mm -hmm. more use, but you use on our young patient, you start to go ham. Mm -hmm. They often they have two channels, and so you use the compare between the left and the right and the baseline. Otherwise, if you're just looking at the numbers, it can be anything else. Yep. Patients asleep. So it's how to um, know. Use it as a trend. Is. Yeah, it's good to detect global problem. I don't think it's good to detect detect uh, local problem like a uh, uh, isolated stroke. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Probably not so good, but just a global fusion problem. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much for sharing this.